Okay, so I'm not even gonna do my intro. I want to talk about the most controversial segment in the entire show. It's the fucking TNT title segment. It was a piece of shit again. They continue the weekly trend of devaluing the TNT championship that Titans built with long reigns and great matches such as Cody Rhodes, Brody Lee, Miro, Darby Allin, and even Sammy to some point. But here, they just they just fully fucking destroy the belt. Like, how more devalued can it get? I know. Let's take a sledgehammer and smash the shit out of it. And that's exactly what mainly Sammy Guevara did. Since Sammy did the actual damage to the title, he's the one who, like, dislodged its parts. While... Frankie just like lightly tapped it with the sledgehammer. And there are some positives here. I like that Sammy and Tay are still heels. And Frankie is still the babyface. And this is just a temporary alliance. Even Frankie himself like insults the two. Uh, Men of the Year on the other hand were so unnecessary in this segment. That you could have just shown the video and have them react backstage. Like, them being in ring did nothing for, like, everyone. So again, bad segment, bad storyline, and bad booking. Tony Khan is fucking up the TNT title again. Just end the storyline already. Come on. Have Scorp face someone else. Don't give it back to Sammy anymore. Come on. Fuck the storyline. Okay, so for the first match, it's the House of Black versus... The Dark Order, composed of Ten and Evil Uno, with Fuego. This was a top-tier TV match. Like, the match quality was great, but House of Black was made to look weak so much. Because there was, like, an even fight between them and a faction that hasn't won on TV for a long time. Uh, Evil Uno and Ten haven't really been built strong, or like any of the Dark Order. Ever since, like, uh, Brody Lee died. Fuego getting in some offense is okay, but not on the leader. Not on Malachi Black, unless it's like a high-stakes match. But yeah, uh, and about that. Malachi Black took too much punishment in this match. Like, he's the leader. He should be the one to come out last. He should be the one to take the least damage. But I think, like, by order of punishment taken, it's... It's Malachi Black who took the most damage, and then Brody King, and then Buddy Matthews. So yeah, this great match, but uh, the booking was a bit shit. (laughs) Yeah, they shouldn't have beaten up Malachi Black too much. It exposes him. They should be dominating like teams like this. But the finish of the match was really cool, though. It starts off with a moonsault by Malachi Black to 10 from the outside, and then Brody King... Ali Yoops Fuego to Buddy Matthews, like on the ramp gap where where Brian Danielson got stuck, and Buddy just like second rope DDT'd Fuego on on the apron, leaving him hanging like that the entire time. It's like it's like a nice visual as Brody King finished the match with the Gonzo bomb on Evil Uno. And again, as I've stated twice already, great match. But you protected the wrong people. And then we get a corny post-match segment where Death Triangle presented a tombstone with House of Black's name on it and the logo of Double or Nothing. Like, it's effectively a challenge. Uh, Pretty corny. Uh, An in-ring scuffle would have sufficed for this. Next, we have a backstage interview by Lexi on Max Caster, Billy Gunn, and the Ass Boys. Uh, They did some nice character work here. This was to address... Anthony Bowens' injury. I liked, I like this new character that the ass boys have, that, that they're like bitches. <laughs> and uh, that Billy Gunn is like preferring the acclaimed more than his own sons. This was funny right here. He just like shoves away Austin Gunn. Austin Gunn is MVP of this whole thing. <laughs> Sad news from Anthony Bowens, but I hope this doesn't stop like this faction from being on TV, from being featured. Maybe have him on a wheelchair or something. I don't know. Have him in a cast. 
Have him with a crutch. I think that's funny enough to get them over. <laughs> Even more than they are right now. So yeah. After this, we get a DraftKings ad that I don't care about. And then another interview, but this time with Tony Schiavone and FTR. And this is better than the one last time. This is them accepting the challenge by Rapongi Vice for next week's Dynamite. The pay-per-view might be too filled up, but come on, that's FTR. This should have been a pay-per-view match. Uh, problem is that Rapongi Vice wasn't built enough, so I guess that's it. So FTR are really good at promos, not just Cash, not just Dax. Uh, they both can do the straight man promo very well. They don't stumble, they don't stutter, and they're like intense as fuck. So yeah. After this is the match between Sean Spears and a mystery giant who turned out to be Big Demo. The one from WCPW back in the day, the one from NXT. Yeah, that Big Demo. Still big, still hairy, and I think still Nikki Cross's husband or boyfriend, I don't know. But yeah, this match was incredibly short. It was almost a squash. Uh, Big Demo got more offense off than Bear Brunson and did less stupid shit. This could have been longer. It, it would have been a better match if it was longer. But uh, I guess you had to build up Sean Spears as the Giant Slayer. Even if he himself is a giant and you just crammed it here now for Wardlow. But I do like how Sean Spears won the match though. He won it by being clever, by being cunning. And this just like reinforces that removing your knee pads gives you like a small attribute boost in your attacks. And yeah, that helped finish the match with Demo. Uh, Spears goes for his uh, Death Valley driver for the three count. And then he calls out Wardlow. And then he cuts a very good promo. But it sounds very much like what Rorschach said in the... Watchmen movie where I'm not stuck in here with you you're stuck in here with me like that <laughs> but you know in a Sean Spears voice nice reference by Sean Spears great promo I'm looking forward to the steel cage match after this we get a backstage promo by the undisputed elite we start off with Adam Cole and Kyle Riley acknowledging that they might face each other Kyle Riley uh, alludes to the finger poke of doom but but he waves it off and says they're gonna have a legit match because they're friends and such and after that uh, the young bucks call out the hardies they challenge them for double or nothing and you know what I don't understand like the, the people who complain about the undisputed elite like ever since the undisputed era they say that these guys are vanilla midgets they can't cut promos and they can't sell but come on man these guys can do anything and here, they show that they're good at promos as well, that not only can they express in such an obnoxious and entertaining way, it's actually funny, but what they're saying also has content and the substance, the meat, if you will, to be good. And that content is basically saying that this is going to be a dream match between two tag teams of different generations. And probably the Hardys are going to win. Uh, the Hardys are going to win and then the Young Bucks are going to take it back in a bigger match in the future. The next match is between Chris Statlander and Red Velvet and this got the second most reactions in the last month <laughs> because number one is the Maki Ito versus Britt Baker but this one got some decent reactions. I honestly thought this was going to be a stinker because I haven't seen Chris Statlander for like a long time on TV and Red Velvet has always been meh in the ring. <laughs> she has been like this uh, diva sort of wrestler type and... It's it's uh, not my type of women's wrestling, but in this match, she's actually really good. Uh, there's this one spot first. Uh, the spot of the match is a rolling German suplex that Red Velvet sells very well. She, like, balances herself on her head and then gets on this, like, split, sort of arousing, knocked-out position. <laughs> the spot that establishes Chris's new character is... The one-handed military press slam. Plus, I never noticed how tall she was, so she might be the one to dethrone Jade Cargill. She has the size for it, now she just has to get on with her promo skills to like be able to get in a feud with Jade. Maybe get some promo reps in, because remember, she didn't talk for like three years. Like her whole run in AEW, she was 
this like weird alien lady who just booped people, whose main like character driver was Orange Cassidy, <laughs> who also didn't talk a lot. So yeah, just just to get in a few reps for Chris Statlander. And the spot that establishes Red Velvet's character is the one where she used the apron on Chris when uh, Chris went for the dive to the outside. Like it was more of a baseball slide, but then she slipped inside the apron and then Red Velvet managed to take control of the match. Another one is the sort of lover's carry by Chris Statlander on Red Velvet, where Red Velvet started doing an Eddie Guerrero appealing to their former friendship and uh, takes advantage of the situation. But uh, during the lover's carry spot, Chris Statlander had none of it. Uh, She just threw her down. Nice power spot. And for the whole match, actually for the whole show, Chris Jericho was in the commentary. He like replaces Jim Ross every rampage. And here, he gets to like uh, interact with somebody who is in another feud. So that's Ruby Soho. They have a nice back and forth, and that's all in well. But when it came to the Owen tournament feud, uh, so like Ruby's own thing going on, uh, the looks she gives, the reaction she gives on the impressive spots that the women do in the ring are like cringy and like overacted. <laughs> I hated looking at these. She's usually a good actress. Uh, she can cut promos, but here, uh, no, no, she's bad on commentary. She pulls back her voice a lot, and also she does a lot of blowing on the mic and these like wows and reactions that like sound terrible (laughs) like oh like that like that it's terrible so the finish of the match is chris statlander knocks red velvet down with the lariat and then puts her in position for the big bang theory but then red velvet rolls her up and then she rolls red velvet up for the three count to advance in the owen tournament but right after this the baddies attack Uh, Jade Cargill attacks, hopefully setting up a feud in the future, but we still have the Owen tournament. So yeah, so they attack, Ruby Soho goes for the save, but but before she goes for the save, uh, Chris Jericho, like a hypocrite heel, uh, says that they're using the numbers game, not seeing the irony to that statement, but yeah. And then, uh, so this is still like 2v3, this isn't enough, so Anna Jay of the Dark Order... Another person who we haven't seen on TV for a long time uh, takes Mark Sterling's crutch and then scares away the baddies. This was a nice post-match segment. Uh, This builds up for maybe what we'll get after the Owen tournament. I don't know if they can pick who they'll face or like what championship they'll get. I don't know if the Owens like the New Japan Cup because Tony Khan hasn't really said anything about the details of the winner. I was expecting that we'll get it after the qualifiers, but I guess we'll get it like on the finals. <laughs> so yeah, we still don't know what the trophy looks like. We don't know what they'll get after. I hope it'll be as prestigious as the New Japan Cup, that they'll get to pick whatever champion they choose to fight and like they'll pick based on like storylines. And as for the match itself, it was actually really good. I wasn't expecting it to be this good. We saw massive improvements in the ring for both women. So I'm going to give this like an above average TV match score because this got the reactions more than like better women's matches have had for the past weeks. And yeah, this was a really good match. And then we get uh, the workout video of the two opposing teams for the buy-in. So that's Danhausen and Hook and Mark Sterling and Tony Nice. I know where this is going. Probably Mark Sterling's gonna fall to Hook. But yeah, this uh, this video package here was very funny. <laughs> uh, it's basically one member of the team is super serious and works out very hard and very well, while the other is like just fucking around in the gym. <laughs> like uh, Danhausen is lifting these super light weights, <laughs> like like the lowest available. I think like they were one pounders or five pounders. But yeah, he was like lifting these. Uh, He was failing to do pull-ups and eating chips while watching Hook do sit-ups. And as for Mark Sterling, like he fails to do squats. He does these cheat push-ups. 
and he gets squatted by Tony Nese. So yeah, very funny video segment. This might be the most enjoyable thing in the entire show. But this is immediately followed by a piece of shit that I already talked about earlier. So let's just move on from that. What's next is a promo battle between Britt Baker and Tony Storm with Tony Schiavone doing the mediation. And uh, Britt, Britt does her usual thing of like fucking around. She has this tone of voice that's totally not serious and that she uses to fuck around with people. Just like she did two weeks ago to set up that tag team match. The Soho and Storm versus Hater and Baker. But this time, Tony was not going to tolerate any of that shit. She delivers an awesome comeback with her intense and somewhat seductive New Zealander accent. And this scares away Brit, uh, setting up the match for next week. After this is a misplacement of two segments. Because what comes right after the Storm vs. Baker promo is like the pre-match sort of interview promo battle between the two sides that we get every week on Rampage, uh, hosted by Mark Henry. So uh, here, it's uh, between BCC and Top Flight. But what comes right after is like a short Jade Cargill promo addressing Anna Jay and like basically setting up the match for Double or Nothing. But here, Jade does it better than the past couple of weeks. She like uses all of her voice, she's more intense, she doesn't hold back anymore. So now I'm gonna talk about the pre-match segment between Top Flight and BCC that should have come after the Jade Cargill promo and for this one, uh, basically it's like the war of like two wrestling philosophies, if I want to be pretentious, because as we know BCC is pushing for violence, for fight 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 all the time, while Matt Seidel is like more of a hippie stoner who pushes for peace, love, and pro wrestling. And how's that going for you, Matt Seidel? (laughs) Like, BCC works much better. Uh, They dominate top flight in this promo, and we see it all in the match that follows. (laughs) And yeah, uh, Mark Henry does his catchphrase announcing the main event. Again, great spot for Mark Henry. Let's hope that Paul White gets a similar role as this. Like a more prominent role because he's stuck in Dark Elevation. And they're paying him, I think, more than they do most of the relevant talent. And this guy is on Dark Elevation. What you doing, Tony Khan? Come on, use this guy more or pay your more relevant wrestlers more. So time for the main event. For this show, it's Blackpool Combat Club. So that's Brian Danielson and John Moxley versus Top Flight. Matt Seidel, and Dante Martin. And you know what? This is obviously the steal your show type match in this show. You put Dante Martin and Matt Seidel in any match and they make it that way. It's almost like an automatic this is awesome chant if you think about it. This is indeed a good match. Uh, Dante does more selling here than what he usually does. Like in that match against Ray Fenix a couple of weeks ago, uh, he doesn't sell a lot. It was like spot, spot, spot in rapid succession. That doesn't give anyone time to breathe. Doesn't give anyone time to sell. Uh, Ray Fenix actually did better with Kyle O'Reilly. And yeah, in this match, they managed to make Dante Martin look stronger while pinning him as well. Because we know that Matt Seidel is clearly the inferior member of this team. Uh, They're going to push Dante Martin in the future. But by pinning him and making it hard to do so, it makes him look strong in defeat. And also, Matt Seidel gets to be kept strong because he's not the one getting pinned. But uh, my problem with uh, Dante Martin is that he kind of does too much. I can't believe that's coming from me, but he does too much. Uh, Like that spot to John Moxley, uh, in the spot of the match, uh, like... Seidel does a meteora to O'Brien on the apron while uh, Dante Martin does like a top rope springboard dive to the other ropes and then he does a moonsault to John Moxley actually. I mean when Dante does this Mox just changes direction so he can take the move and that looks staged as hell. <laughs> so yeah th- that one didn't look that good but it was an awesome spot if they just 
like uh, kept it simpler for Dante. Actually, he should learn a thing or two from from his mentor Matt Seidel here because Matt, even though he doesn't do as much complicated shit as Dante does, he manages to look good. He's botch free all the time. <laughs> and there's one move here where Dante botches. He does like a flying drop kick, a flying a horizontal drop kick to John Moxley, but he falls short. Like he clearly falls short. And uh, good thing Mox, with an incredible processor as a veteran, he turns it into a pile driver and it still manages to look good and planned as well. The other spot of the match is the one where uh, Danielson does the butterfly suplex on Martin and they transitions this to uh, a label lock. And then the whole time where Dante is trying to get to the ropes, that was... Really, really cool. That's that's mainly the thing that made him look strong the most. So we get the story progressed in commentary as well by the members of the two factions. The finish of the match is basically they do their spot. Like the usual spot that, that we see them do with Wheeler. Where they're all in the ring delivering elbows to their opponents. And then uh, Danielson just keeps doing this to Seidel. It gets like softer but... Uh, Mox does the paradigm shift on Martin and then ends the match 1-2-3. You know what? I should be enjoying this match more. Usually, usually this would be better for me, but I watch tons of wrestling now. <laughs> like, I have started reviewing wrestling from, like, Noah and here. And there are a lot of better matches out there. This also isn't as epic as it needs to be. Like... I think the fact that we haven't seen these two team on TV, uh, they don't have any feuds. Like, this is just a random put-together match on a main event. If, like, on the undercard, this would be awesome. But on the main event, it should be, like, a storyline match. And this doesn't have one. It's not even part of the tournaments. So, yeah. So, that might have contributed to things. And also, we clearly knew who was going to win this. Like, it was obvious that BCC were going to win. So... That uh, really took away from the match. As for the post-match beatdown, it doesn't really add much. It's just a run-of-the-mill like uh, beatdown, and then uh, and then the allies come for the save. If they included Danielson's leg being stuck on the ramp, that would have made this more interesting. But we get this like externally, like not in the show, because that did look like a shoot. Uh, how how Danielson's leg got stuck in the in the ramp, in the gap between the ramp and the ring. But we later find out uh, there's like, they release a video where Danielson clearly whispers to Bryce Remsburg that he's fine and then he just wants to sell it. If you included that, this might have made this more interesting. I hope they show it on Dynamite. That would be awesome. But yeah, that's, that's uh, pretty much this show. So overall, this was an unspectacular episode of AW Rampage. It was below average to average, and the only match I really cared about was the women's match. First one had poor booking, did not protect Malachi enough. Second one should have been longer since we know Big Demo can work. Three was really good and, and um, establishes these two women as like legit factors in the women's division. And the main event was predictable and was kind of random to be put in this like episode of Rampage that's so close from the pay-per-view. So that's pretty much it. Like, comment, and subscribe for engagement. And hit that bell notification for updates to future videos. Bye bye and fuck the TNT title. <laughs>